if I look at MIT today and reflect back on 1976 when I came here, um, it's an entirely different place. I was the only woman on the faculty at Sloan. There had never been a woman head of the department, never been a woman associate dean or whatever, even less a woman president. I was of an age and uh, status, I guess, where I was asking for very, very little. And I was old enough to realize I wasn't asking for anything compared to what most people had. And I couldn't get it. And that was what finally really made me understand that um, I couldn't escape this problem. Nancy Hopkins became conscious that it was harder for women to do well at MIT. Is there something about their gender that is getting in the way of their being taken seriously? I sat down one day and wrote a letter to President Vest, and I said, you know, there's a terrible chronic problem in this institution. I'm sure you don't know about it, because if you did, you'd certainly want to fix it. And so I described some aspects of what I saw was discrimination against women, preventing them from doing science the way they should be able to. And I showed it to a friend of mine. He said, you can't send that to the president of MIT. He won't know what the heck that means. He'll throw it right out, and he'll think badly of you, whatever. So I thought, OK, I'll run this by a woman scientist, another woman, and ask her what she thinks and make sure it's not offensive and won't offend President Vest. So I, took, I chose a person who was a very successful scientist, but I didn't know very well, because I wanted a very objective opinion of whether this was a polite, reasonable letter. I asked her to read it. She reads the letter. She says, I'd like to sign this letter, <laughs> and I'd like to go with you to see President Vest, because I agree with everything you've said here. And I said, you do? It was going to be difficult to establish sort of statistically that, that these women were being disadvantaged, but you thought at least if you could have uh, find out some data about their situation. You could find out something about their salaries, something about the amount of space they were getting and resources. We decided to ask for a committee that would gather the data in a very systematic way and try to explain to the dean so he could understand it, so he could fix it. I distinctly remember the, the journey to the dean's office. We had, we had no idea what was going to happen, but he listened. Virginia appointed a committee with one woman from each of the departments, except math, and he couldn't appoint a woman from math because they didn't have one. It was great to have men as members of the committee because they were with us on this. Uh, women with the, the ability to do great things should be given the opportunity to, to do great things, and there shouldn't be any distinction or any, any hindrance that. Nancy famously had a tape measure which she took and actually measured square feet of spaces. It was really amazing to watch her in action. We presented this to our dean, to the provost, to the president. What came out of that study was the feeling of a kind of pattern of systematic minimizing of the role of women, particularly after they got tenured. My main goal was, how can we make this a report so we can get it out to the faculty? And Lottie read it and said, this must be published. I asked the chair of the faculty to send it to the president and see if he wanted to write something to go with it, because we didn't want MIT to look as if they'd been blindsided, because they hadn't. Yeah. We'd worked with them. We wanted to work with them. What I said was approximately this. I said, I've always believed that uh, Gender bias in universities is part perception and part reality. And from this report, I've learned that it's mostly reality. Quite an emotional thing to see the president of the institution say, yes, this is true, this happened. His comment that he thought that discrimination was more perception and now realizes it's more reality was one of the things that was picked up by all the newspaper reports and I think made an enormous difference. A day later I read that on the front page of the New York Times and the front page of the Boston Globe and then the San Francisco Chronicle. CNN and Time, Ivy Bias. She's a highly respected scientist who says she was treated like a second-class citizen by one of the most prestigious universities in America. 
This ha could not have happened to any man in my department. It just couldn't. And Professor Nancy Hopkins' complaints led to an unlikely confession. MIT acted the way you want institutions to behave. And they acted the way as scientists and engineers particularly you want to behave. Here are the facts. This is what we understand to be the truth. We have to stand by it, and we take the consequences, what they are. We, you know, it took a lot of courage to do what Chuck Vest did. He did the right thing in a very simple way. There were a couple of days in which Nancy and I were literally getting a thousand or so messages a day. I, I've never, ever experienced anything like this. They came from first from all over the country, universities. Then they started coming from researchers and companies. Then they started coming from overseas, and they all said the same thing. This is my story. What we did not imagine was that the response would have been so open, so transparent, and so positive. The effect of the report, I think, was went way beyond anything that I had expected. Clinton invited Nancy Hopkins to the White House. It put gender on the table. I mean, it had never been talked about. It recommended that there be more uh, equitable salary distribution and recommended uh, that women be put on all the search committees. Increase the number of women, give women responsibility, put women in position of power, uh, put women in committee, change the way in which you do searches without biases. I think what we accomplished was showing that there can be mechanisms for change that don't have to be threatening to an institution. There are ways to deal with these kinds of things openly, and that's where Chuck Fest was so incredibly courageous. From the time we first give toys to a two-year-old, we're already giving boys trucks and we're giving girls dolls. It's sort of the, a pattern embedded in our society which gives women a lot of credit for being caretakers, raising their children, uh, being friendly, being supportive personally of other people, but not people who would be leaders or who would make innovations or who would change things, uh, who would have ideas, new ideas. That's the role of men. And I think that this, this rather subtle discrimination between men and women is something that every woman, and when he thinks about it, every man, is probably aware of. These inequities can be repaired, and they were repaired, and that, one, that the institution has to watch very carefully to make sure they don't develop. We have to keep consciously correcting for those uh, small but important biases that we all carry around. People don't even think they're prejudiced very frequently, but they are. And, and part of it is because we are all raised in, in, a, in a milieu which basically harbors such prejudices and we are exposed to them from a very early time. And we've got we to clean our minds of such prejudices. We have to really confront them. It's sort of hard to just go up to a guy and say, look, this is a problem. What are you doing to take care of it? It has a strong parallel with racial stereotypes, but the great thing about an intellectual society is it should be able to work to overcome that because our shared values are, say, that we don't want to be racist and we don't want to be sexist. We want to be unbiased and open-minded and take people uh, at their value and not uh, come to come with, with assumptions about what they uh, their, their limitations or their qualities. It was a wonderful experience, emotionally, intellectually, because it, we had an impact. Now, um, you know, it's not at all unusual to have women department heads and we have, you know, women represented at all levels of the administration and we had a woman president. I'm very proud of her being part of this group. And I have, we have remained so good friends, uh, we call ourselves the old gang.